everyone. Two missionary letters to go over. Well, I have three, but you can read that one on the back table. These others on the, are on the back table also, but this one, you can see why they don't want me to read it if you go look at it, but you might want to read it. All right, first one, Hoffman's to New Zealand, hopefully, Lord willing. Dear friends, New Zealand has opened an immigration site for new visa applications as of July 4th. Jenny and I will be able to submit our visas this week and wait for New Zealand to approve them. Please pray that there are no delays as we would like to be able to purchase our plane tickets within a few weeks. Our departure date is tentatively for early October. Much of this depends on when our visas are approved. Your faithful prayers, support, and patience while we have waited for New Zealand to open, reopen their borders and beginning approving visas again is very much appreciated. Last month, Jenny and I celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary, which is a happy milestone. We were able to get away for a little while, which was very relaxing. We learned recently that Pastor Larry Williams, for whom we have been requesting prayer, went home to be with the Lord. While we sorrow for the family and church and their loss, we rejoice that he is in heaven with the Lord free from pain. I've been honored to fill in for a pastor in Alabama who is recovering from knee surgery and will be sharing the preaching in New Zealand via Zoom for the next few months until we are able to head over. Later in July, we'll be in South Florida for a meeting with a supporting church who asked to see us before we leave. In August, we will head out to Wyoming and then to Pennsylvania, both for mission conferences with supporting churches. We want to take a moment to say thank you to all the churches and folks who have provided funds for our setup funds. As Paul said to the church of Philippi, but I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. May the Lord richly bless you all for how you have been such a blessing to us. We love you and appreciate all that you've done for us and continue to do in Christ, Brett and Jenny Hoffman. And the other letter I'll read is from the Mumpers in Canada. And I'll definitely be leaving out quite a bit of this, so you might want to go read that on the back table. Uh, let me see. Hello from Kingston, Ontario. Again, we are late with a prayer letter. This, things have been in such a state of constant change that it's hard to catch up. We are truly thankful for your love and support through these strange times. Our church congregation is almost totally different from pre-COVID years. We have seen many people come and visit since we since reopening after the shutdowns most just visit some stayed some of our new folks have been such a joy they love the preaching we've been preaching through the book of first john for a few months now and it's so foundational several people have now requested baptism later in this paragraph they say we have purchased a portable baptistry and have three definite candidates so praise the lord i randy fell ill the night of June 5th. By June 6th, I was unable to walk and fell and couldn't get up. Paramedics had to be called and in the hospital, I think I'll, hopefully I say this right, cellulitis with um, septic amenia was diagnosed. It was a very severe case. I'm just now getting back to feeling more normal. As you know, we are in our 70s and still able to preach and teach, but we need help. We need someone to help with music, transportation, visitation, and children's work. We love you and appreciate each one of you. For his glory, Randy and Ellen. So let's look to the Lord for both of these families, shall we? Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for our missionaries. Thank you that you give us funds to support them and you give us ability to pray for them and help us to do so. Lord, thank you for the Hoffmans. Um, praise you for their willingness to go to New Zealand, help them to get there quickly. Thank you that they're fully funded now with their set of funds and the borders are open to New Zealand. Um, help there not to be any delays with their visas and that they could get the plane tickets purchased, Lord. Uh, and with the church there, um, Victory Baptist Church in Ashburton, please help uh, them to continue on uh, for you and um, I'm not sure if this was their pastor, Larry Williams, without this man, Lord, fill, fill, fill the pop 
respite and um, fill each need there. Please help them. Lord, uh, do bless the Hoffmans and do give them safety, wisdom, and direction. Lord, uh, for the Mumpers, thank you for them and them serving you at even the age they are, Lord. Uh, Lord, bless them and continue to meet all their needs. Thank you for their service there in Canada for you. Thank you for the people that visited their church and the ones that stayed. Thank you so much for them. Thank you for the three who want to be baptized and uh, help everything to go well with the baptisms. Lord, thank you for Randy getting him back to normal um, after his illness. Please heal him up completely if he's not already. Lord, uh, do help they're in the ministry as they're asking for help, that they need help. Um, they mentioned certain things, music and transportation, visitation, children's work. Please give them uh, the folk they need to help them there. And if not, Lord, just strengthen them so much that they can do the work without others. But we know you have different gifts for different people. And if there's some lacking, please bring them in and do bless these people in their older age. and for the ministry they have done there. Lord, thank you for all you've done, all you're going to do. Thank you for pastor, and please bless the rest of the night and the preaching from your word. May your will be done in everything. In Christ's name, amen. Well, good evening. Oh, we're going to take an offering. All right. I was thinking about that in the back of my mind. You boys, come on forward. Look at these guys. Aren't they something? Aren't they handsome? Asha's going to pray for her offering. And we'll have an offertory, too. All right. Hold on one second, boys. Just a reminder, if you'd like to give something, be kind to the Nicholsons and uh, bless them. You can make a uh, check payable to the church. We're going to give them a check, Okay. be in 1st Timothy chapter number 4 this evening. Please be mindful of and praying for. We've got a group going down to the Creation Museum and then the Ark. And so if you would pray for us as we're heading out of town tomorrow and uh, praying for a refreshing trip, spiritually refreshing and physically refreshing. And so um, praying for that group. So 1 Timothy chapter number 4, when you find your place there, let's stand together and uh, we'll read God's word there. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. And in verse number 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, 
nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. If you would uh, look at verse number 6 again quickly, he said, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, You'll be a good minister, good minister, a good servant. Um, minister a lot of times is used as a title for a pastor, which the pastor should be a minister, uh, but we're all called to be ministered one to another. And we're going to look at this chapter. We can preach several sermons on it. Uh, but we're just going to give an overview of chapter number four here in 1 Timothy, what it means to be a good minister or how to be a good minister one to another. Uh, and so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on His Word tonight. Father, we just love You. We thank You for being so good to us. We thank You for being so merciful and kind and loving. We thank You that uh, You love us as Your dear children tonight. And Lord, we thank You for... Uh, just another opportunity on this Lord's Day to seek your face through the Word of God. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would use the Word of God to enlighten our minds. May we see ourselves here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding minds and receiving hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be changed just a little bit more into the image of our Savior tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So verse number one, here's a warning. It says, The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, speaketh expressly in the latter times. And the latter times are going to be between Christ's first coming and then His second coming. And uh, we know that during this time frame, Paul says that things will wax worse and worse. He calls it perilous times. This means it's like a demonic storm that is raging. Uh, this morning we looked at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. We talked about being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So not only do we live in a fallen world, which will one day be redeemed, this is creation itself, waits for the redemption to wit. It's going to be a beautiful paradise on earth when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. We see little glimpses of beauty in nature, uh, but nature is conspiring to kill you. I can I could go off and tell you how much violence I've just seen in my backyard, you know, cats eating birds and birds eating other birds and foxes chasing squirrels and I, I mean uh, just nature itself is a violent place whether it's on the macro scale or on the micro scale. You have little invisible germs that want to invade your body and take you out and it's going to happen one of these days. So don't worry about it. It's going to happen one of these days. And then humanity, humanity itself is a fallen, broken creature. Uh, so not only are they at odds with God, but then also they're at odds with their fo fellow man. Uh, right now they're studying how to destroy each other uh, and how to uh, subdue one another and take control of the masses and all these things are going on. But then also mankind is at enmity with God himself. Uh, and so young preacher boy Timothy, uh, he's probably 
underneath 40 years of age at this point, and uh, he's a young man and he's a Greek audience and the Greek esteem elders, and we should esteem elders, but in here it says, let no man despise thy youth. Uh, and here we see that, Timothy, you have got the answers and that here inside of chapter number four, uh, Paul gives a few pointers on how young Timothy can be a good minister of Jesus Christ, how he can be a blessing and a servant to those people that are around them. First off, Timothy, he says, realize this, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, here's a spiritual warfare that's going to rage. Here it says, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. We call this apostatize. Apostatize means to depart. It means to have known the truth and have fallen away, away from the truth, not enduring sound doctrine, going away. So it says, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. And it says, giving heed to seducing spirits. So there's seducing spirits, and it says doctrines, plurality, doctrines of devils. You have spiritualism, modernism, Darwinism, communism, Nazism, uh, postmodernism, all sorts of isms there. And so the doctrines of devils can be a thousand different doctrines. I remember reading a book here not too long ago about Joseph Smith. You know Joseph Smith, that in 10 years he had 100,000 followers. That's pretty incredible, and that was without the internet. I mean, he had a stronghold on people, and uh, people would even uh, be converted on, uh, over in Europe and uh, go across the Atlantic and, and join his uh, group down in Missouri, go out to Utah where you find the Mormons today. Uh, and so they're seducing spirits. Seducing has to do uh, with being drawn away, being lured. So when you read about the seductress there uh, in the book of Proverbs, how she takes a young man with her eyelids and she flatters him and woos him and draws him in and draws in the net. Uh, so is the seducing spirits of these false doctrines out there that these false teachers are going to be empowered by Satan and they are going to have allurement and they are going to have enticement. And notice here it says doctrines, again, plurality. Anytime you see the word doctrines, plural, in the Bible it has to do uh, with demonism. Anytime you see doctrine, uh, good doctrine, we'll see, it's, it's singular. There is one doctrine, uh, one teaching from the Word of God, and that is the true doctrine. And so the Spirit speaketh that there's going to be seducing spirits, there's going to be doctrines of devils. Uh, and then it says in verse number 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So it so says speaking lies in hypocrisy. One, one thing that... Um, you can never do. You, you cannot um, live a holy life by cleaning up your flesh. Okay, so you can, you know, you can have a society. I know a lot of guys who lived over in the Middle East, you can have a society where um, all you show on a woman's body is this right here. And they think, well, surely, I mean, there's going to be uh, no problem with lust over there in the Middle East. Uh, do you, you know the number one country that downloads pornography in the world? Pakistan. You know that? You know why? Because you cannot, uh, you cannot control the flesh by rules and by regulations and man-made precepts and man-made control. So it's a speaking lies in hypocrisy. If someone says that they are a holy person and they do not have the power of God in them, remember we talk about grace this morning. Grace is both the desire and the power uh, to uh, obey God's word and to follow him. By grace are you saved and by grace do you live for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not going to be by rules and regulations. Remember that the Pharisaical crowd were the number one opponent to the Lord Jesus Christ when he is here on this earth. And his accusation of them is that they teach uh, the doctrines of men for commandments of God. And this is exactly what it's talking about in verse number two. Well, look at this. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So let's look at verse number two again. 
Um, sometimes you can draw a spiritual truth from a verse taken out of context. And let me tell you, um, this verse is a common example of that. How many ever heard your conscience seared? Meaning that, you know, uh, the first time you look at something that you ought not to be looking at, uh, it's your conscience condemns you. But then the second time it gets a little bit easier. And then a little bit easier, then your conscience is seared. You do something, go a place that you're not supposed to go. I mean, the first time you come there, your conscience is saying, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't do that. Uh, and then the second time, the conscience is a little more um, malleable. And then after a while, it doesn't even bother you because you have a seared conscience. I never heard that. How many have never heard that before? How many... So I've always, I've always heard this growing up, and then one time, you know, it's amazing when you preach the Word of God in context, um, how things just like, you know, the game changes here. Uh, what this is talking about is spiritual Pharisaism, and I'll explain this in a minute. Uh, and so, so they're speaking lies in hypocrisy, and they're conscious of having been seared with a hot iron. So Joseph Smith, I just watched a document. I'm not saying you should go watch this. It's pretty graphic. Uh, it's about uh, the FLDS Church. The Fundamentalists of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And what they're doing is they're going back to the writings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and their foundational teachings and practicing out what their founders actually said. They're not going to change with the modern times. They're going to go back to the fundamentals of their faith. Uh, and so... These FLDS church, um, some of these guys, some of these elders, they have like 57 wives. You know, imagine being like 15 year old and ha have to marry an 85 year old man. Uh, you imagine, like, how in the world do people go for that? Well, it's interesting to hear these victims talk, uh, these young girls and things, saying that I'm tr I was trying to be so pure. Uh, and so clean and so holy that one day they would move me down to Zion and Zion was going to be the new hub down in Texas uh, and they were going to go and be there uh, and they thought perhaps it was wrong but then they remembered if they resist they ran away from their husband I mean the poor guy would only have 56 women left and probably feel lonely and deserted uh, but uh, if I left I knew that I would go to hell you know what that is? a seared conscience by lies spoken in hypocrisy. Uh, it was funny, the leader, when he's on the run from the FBI there, uh, Jeffries, he, uh, he's going to Disney World, he's going to all sorts of naughty places there in Las Vegas and uh, ordering things. You know what he couldn't, he couldn't do, even with 57 uh, wives and this holiness that he preached, is that he could not live a holy life why? Because he did not have the Spirit of God living inside of him. Uh, let me give further explanation of this. Uh, the reformer Martin Luther, uh, when he surrendered his life to be a monk, uh, he's supposed to be a lawyer, his dad was paying for the bill, uh, and he's coming back to mom and dad one night, and he gets caught in a thunderstorm, and I don't know if you've ever been in a, th a real thunderstorm, been caught in a thunderstorm, but that is a very scary experience. And so he got caught in this thunderstorm, and he thought God was going to kill him. So he promised St. Anne. How many know who St. Anne is? That's Mary's mom. There's no proof of that. Uh, and so, I mean, he, you know, didn't feel worthy to talk to Mary, but he is going to talk to St. Anne. And that was the patron saint of the family. So he promised St. Anne that he would surrender to be a priest if, if God would let him live through this thunderstorm. And so, man, he kept his word to St. Anne, and he became a monk. But then later on, he got born again by studying the Word of God, which he was, he was uh, under directive to do in his university. He came across Romans 1.17, the just shall live by his faith. And he realized uh, that being a monk and sleeping on hard cots and uh, freezing cold temperatures and ruining his health and walking, you know, uh, walking to Rome and going up the steps on his knees and all this stuff, uh, that that wasn't going to 
trying to get him anywhere with God, that he just had to place his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he would be justified. And all the burdens and the weight of his own sin and guilt just melted off there and he became born again by the Word of God. And as he studied the Word of God, he realized that the Pope was wrong, the Pope was the vicar of hell, that these indulgences were wicked. Uh, and he writes his uh, 95 thesis and gets called, uh, he gets called into worms and he's standing there uh, before and he says this, he says, my conscience is held captive by the word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other. So his conscience went from being seared by the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church to being in underneath the control and underneath the auspices of the scripture of truth. I'll give you another example. Bill Grady was telling me that uh, he was a typewriter salesman before he got saved, uh, and he went to this Baptist church, and they had a big Christian school, and they were going to order like 270 typewriters, and this was back, I think, in the early 70s. These typewriters were $300 a piece, and that's a lot, that was a huge sale. It been a big sale of the year. So he goes in there, and uh, this Baptist preacher who is uh, ordering these temp typewriters, he says, has anybody ever showed you from the Bible how you can know for sure if you die, you go to heaven? Uh, and he says, no. Now, he had been showed before, but he's making a sale, you know? Uh, and so the guy shows him the Romans road, and he's nodding his head, and he gets down to the end, and he's going to close the sale, man, one way or another, you know, he's going to make, no, I don't want to mess nothing up. So he prays this prayer with the Baptist uh, to be saved. And he says, when he walked out of the building, he felt like he betrayed God Almighty in the church. He felt like the parking lot itself was the mouth of hell and it was going to swallow him and take him down to hell for him listening to a Baptist preacher. He had a good priest, man. If you have a good Catholic priest, man, that will put the fear into you. And, uh, you know, if you know a staunch Catholic, they are afraid to even go on the campus of some other church besides the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And that's what it's talking about. Your conscience seared as with a hot iron. It has to do with uh, spiritual hypocrisy and adding something to the grace of God. Look, if you will, at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2, Paul writes about this. Colossians 2 and verse number 21. And really the whole chapter is about this subject in Colossians 2. Uh, but 2.21 he says, Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men, question mark, doctrines and commandments of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. And so let me read you a little quote. Here is from William Barclay. He said, this was an ever reoccurring heresy in the church in every generation. Men arose who tried to be stricter than God. So a lot of times you feel if someone is absolutely stricter, they must be holier. Um, and let me talk about legalism, you know. A lot of times we throw around that term very loosely. Here's what a legalist is. Anyone who is stricter than me, and here's what a liberal is. Anyone who has looser rules than me. That's a joke, okay? Uh, and so, uh, but true legalism is this. Legalism is that you have, to, you have to do something to earn God's grace. Some say you need, uh, you need to do something to earn God's grace and salvation. You need to be baptized, or you need to do this, that, or be faithful to church, or give to the church. And then you have merited God's favor and you can be saved. You know, there's the two religions, do and done, right? But then there is also legalism. A lot of times people who like to um, impose rules upon parishioners say, well, that, that's, that's what legalism is. It just works for salvation. Uh, but there also is the legalism is that you do something to earn God's favor in your life as well. 
if, you know, if I do this and don't go to this place and wear this or do this or that or the other, then God will smile upon me and show his favor unto me. And if I do this stuff and don't do this other stuff, God likes me better than he likes you. I have found favor with God because I do X, Y, and Z. How many are with me? All right, let's move on. And, and so he says there's uh, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, those that have a seared conscience. And really, let me tell you something. Uh, in legalistic cultures, the kids don't get saved because they really think that in order for God to be happy with them, they have got to live up to the standard. And I got news for you. You can't live up to the standard. And... Let me tell you something else, too. We're all, in one sense, hypocrites because we all preach a message that we ourselves, from time to time, do not live up to. How many are with me there? Uh, and so, so he says, there's those there with a seared conscience. And, uh, and so in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, again, here, we think of the Roman Catholic Church right out of the blocks in verse number three, forbidding to marry and, you know, fish on Fridays, on Lent, whatever, uh, forbidding meats uh, and things. Again, they're going to be stricter than God is, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Uh, and so if somebody imposes their own rules or their own standards on the Bible, they are Bible deniers. So let me tell you something. In the Bible, you have the commands of God, thou shalt and thou shalt not. It's, some stuff is as plain as the nose on my face. You know, so I always have to say this in church so I don't have to say it after the fact like everybody's surprised. For a man and a woman to live together before they're married, thou shalt not, okay? <laughs> Hadn't changed, all right? Uh, and, and you should not, shalt not tell a lie, uh, you know, thou shalt not commit a dog. There's a lot of thou shalt nots. And then there's also commands. Uh, but most of the Christian living is biblical principle. And if we're called unto grace, we're not living in accordance. Grace doesn't call you just to live in accordance with the law of God. It calls you above and beyond the law's demands uh, into a free Christian realm. So it says, Look at this in verse number three again. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So what should you know to be able to discern and whether I, we could turn to 1 Timothy 1.5 it talks about a pure conscience and to have a pure conscience that is in line with the word of God we're supposed to know the truth. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And really, that doesn't mean that, you know, if I insult you, you shouldn't be offended if you love the Bible. Uh, it really has to do with you're not offended by anything in the Word of God. And then also, all these seducing spirits and all these lies, these doctrines of devils out there, you're not going to be led astray either because you're going to have knowledge of the truth. And let's look at the next verse there. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified, notice this, by the word of God and prayer. Uh, so here is the measurement. Whatever it is, I'm supposed to examine it by the word of God. I was talking to Josh this morning where he was teasing. But he, said, he was talking about Deuteronomy 25, man shall not uh, wear that which pertaineth to a woman, a woman, a man. I said, I said, what, uh, I, want to, I want to look at your fabric ingredients because if you are wearing mismatched fabric as well, that is an abomination in the eyes of God in the same chapter. And we can get into that chapter. You notice the last, the last word in that chapter is skirt. You know who that skirt belongs to? Father's skirt. It's amazing how you examine something in its context. Now, there is a principle of dress, modesty, identity, separation. I'm supposed to be identified with Christ. And so there's principles in this life. I'm not going to claim a verse, and then I'm going to fill in all the blanks for you, and I'm going to explain exactly to the T 
exactly what you should do. You know, if you ladies get, you know, that ball on the back of your head up in a bun really, really tight, you'll be very godly. And the longer that skirt goes down, the more godly you will be, the more favor you will find with God. Uh, and so, again, there's principles in the Word of God. And so here is the test. Can it be received by the Word of God and by prayer? So what I am doing, um, can I sanctify it? Sanctify means set apart to holy. Can I still pray? Is it messing up my communion with the Lord? Can I talk to Him? Do I feel a good, clean conscience that in the Word of God there's nothing that forbids it? There's, there's, and it's something that God has given. I can receive it with thanksgiving. I can examine it, question it by the Word of God. And then also I can pray and talk to the Lord the whole time that I'm involved in it. And that is going to be the question. So notice this in verse number 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. A good minister does this, number one. A good minister preaches the word. So 2 Timothy chapter number 4, I charge thee before uh, Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, preach the word, be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, so, you know, that's, a, that's the job as office of a pastor, but that is also true of a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved, the church is to be speaking to one another and also singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And so everything, it should be examined and expounded upon the Word of God. It says it's sanctified, it's cleansed. Uh, the whole purpose of us gathering here uh, however many times a week is so that we would get into the Word of God and somebody would get behind the sacred desk and read Scripture, explain it, and expound it. Why? So that everything in your life could be sanctified by the Word of God and by prayer. Number two, look at verse number seven. It says... But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. And it says there, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Number two, so a good minister, a good, a godly minister preaches the Word of God. A good and godly minister also practices the Word of God. We looked this morning where Paul said to Timothy, he says, you fully know my doctrine and you fully known my manner of life. Look, if you will, um, to verse number 12. It says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And so, here he says, not only do you preach the word of God, you also practice the word of God. Um, it's so much easier to imitate and to mimic behavior, and following someone's behavior is learned a whole lot faster uh, than them just teaching it to you. You know, it's amazing. You know, you are the people that you are around. You are an assimilation of the five people you spend the most time with. It's assimilation of character. It's just a principle of truth. And so he says, in the household of faith, young Timothy, he says, live a godly lifestyle in front of all the people. And he uses this term, exercise thyself unto godliness. I know a lot of your life verses in the Bible there. Um, bodily exercise profiteth little. You know, and what's that talking about? Um, he says, bodily exercise, it profiteth, but only profiteth for a little time, little season. And let me tell you something, you know, people a long time ago, look at those trails that the Apostle Paul walked, man. That guy was in shape. He got his 10,000 steps in every single day. 
And I really think the allusion here uh, is to uh, this Greek culture that really emphasized the aesthetics of the body. And, uh, and he says, So bodily exercise profiteth little. He says, But godly exercise profits in this time and then also the time to come. Now you and I, you know, we are not earning favor with God. His favor is already abundant. He already loves you. And all you have to do is receive His favor. As we said this morning, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him each and every day. Uh, I'm to go before the Lord and I need the strength and I need the power and I need the ability to serve you. I can't do anything. Without, uh, without you, I can do nothing. And I'm telling the Lord that and I'm receiving His unmerited favor. And then I'm to walk with Him in love. And, and uh, here in this, this context, he says that you are to build up yourself. The last verse we'll look at here in a minute. Uh, but it says, he says, if you exercise, your profiting will appear before all. We saw Nick yesterday. He's at the races, man. Oh, Nick's, um, I said, Nick, what have you been doing? You been going to football camps? He's like, yeah, I've been going. I went to six so far. I said, six? Good grief. So every week he's going to football camp, and oh boy, man, he's just puffed up. I mean, he's not in his head, in his body, man. He is, he is jacked big time. I mean, he has been working out and exercising. And I want to say this, his profiting is evident to all, man. He just looks great, nice V shape there, man. You know, just a, just a stud of a guy. You know what he's been doing faithfully? Each and every day hitting that gym, working out, exercising. And so here's what Paul commands young Timothy to do. He says, you exercise thyself rather unto godliness. He says, give attendance unto reading. He says, give attendance unto doctrine. He says that thy profiting might be seen before all. You know, the old saying in sports, working out, if you don't use it, you what? You know, that is, that was, uh, that's true of athleticism. That's also true of your spiritual walk with God. That each and every day that we should have an avid walk with God out of a heart's desire and out of love. Uh, tomorrow morning before we go on the trip, I'm going to be at the gym. Paul said, heard you're going to CrossFit, then you're going to work out. I said, you better believe it. That's a non-negotiable. Man, I've already, I don't have to like, am I going to work out this morning? Like, no, man, I'm going to be at the gym. Buddy, see you there, 615 class, you know, we'll be slinging sweat and breathing heavy at the mouth and the whole night. You know what you're supposed to do each and every day out of love for God? As a, you are to be in that word of God with a, just an insatiable appetite, memorizing, meditating, praying, talking to the Lord, learning doctrine, learning what you believe, learning, knowing how that you ought to answer every man that you're studying to show yourself approved unto God. Uh, and so he says, you're practicing what you know. And that is true of the preacher. And woe to the preacher, woe to the man of God who's only studying for sermons to give out information to other people. Woe to that person. You know what I'm supposed to be doing each and every day? I'm supposed to be feeding my own soul and learning for my own soul and my own walk with God. Uh, that what your desire should be as a Christian, that you would be a man or you'd be a woman of God that is solely sold out to God and His Word. You're not falling uh, for this phony list of rules that find you favor with God. What you're finding is you're worshiping and you're finding God through His Word. That you are supposed to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that you, by the Word of God, 
you'll enter into that victorious Christian life, that promised land living, that you'll find your lot, your God-given place, your God-given calling in this life, and uh, you, will, you will profit in your sphere and in your realm and in your home. And then everybody around you, we're not doing it to be seen of men, First, we're going to be seen of God, but everybody that's around your spirit is going, man, what's happened to you? I think it's every once in a while. I had this answer the first time. Someone said um, to me after a service, well, what happened to you? Did you take a spiritual pill? And I said, maybe you did. Think about that. <laughs> All of a sudden they came into church and they had an appetite for the word of God. <laughs> Someone said, well, you get, been getting alone with God? I'll say, uh, well, maybe you have. Uh, man, maybe I'm the same. Uh, and uh, maybe you're the one that is spiritually improved. And so he says that your profiting might appear unto all. And so a good minister preaches the word of God, practices the word of God. And then uh, number three, a good minister progresses in the word. And let's read on further. And so in... In chapter number four there, we look down in verse number nine. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For thereunto we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of all those that believe. So everybody benefits from Christ. Someone's breathing his air. By him all things Consists, the Bible says, he's blessed all men, but especially you and I who, uh, who are saved by him, believe on him. Verse number 11, these things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, Neglect not the gift in the, uh, that is in thee, which was given unto thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting might appear unto all. Notice this. Take heed unto thyself, unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Notice the admonition there. Um, as you grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it does not just benefit you. It benefits anybody that's underneath your influence and underneath your hearing. That means your coworkers. That means your spouse. That means your children. That means your grandchildren. And he says, if you take heed to yourself, he says, you take heed to the doctrine, you'll save both them and they that hear thee. Let me give you one illustration, and I'm done. Um, there's a church. It doesn't matter what the church is. <laughs> Not here to talk about the church. Uh, but uh, Bill Grady used to teach there, and I remember him. He came down to our, our college, Heartland Baptist Bible College, and uh, somebody asked me, I said, what, what, do you think about, uh, what do you think about that church? He said, well, let me tell you. He says, when I went there, he says, the whole auditorium was packed. He says, I was there for 10 years. And he said, they baptized 10,000 people, 10,000 people. And he said, they never had to add a pew. Think about that. You have 10,000 people baptized, 10,000, no, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. They had, in 10 years, 100,000 people baptized. 10,000 a year, for 10 years, 100,000 people baptized, and they never had to add a pew. Now, we had a baptism service this morning. Praise God for these saints got baptized. I'm very excited for each and every one of them. I never heard about... Uh, Churches that, man, baptized tons and tons and tons of converts. This same church that I'm talking about, I know is in the 2000, baptized 25,000 people in one year. 
in one year. I was out at West Coast Baptist College. I was out there for a conference, and I saw someone from that uh, school. This guy's name, I'll tell you his name. This is pretty funny. His name is James Jones. For some reason, he didn't go by Jim. I uh, have a good pastor in Port Huron, Michigan. I said, Brother Jones, we're sitting at the table eating. I said, what are you doing here? Because this is completely out of his circle. This is different. He says, you know, I was in my alma mater's church. On a Wednesday night, they were presenting me with an award for something. And he says, I looked around, and I've been gone, I think, for 15 years. He says, I looked around, and I recognized everybody in the auditorium. And he says, you know, I've got to find another group to run with. Now, here's my point, okay? Is that he says, if you give attendance, take heed to yourself, and you take heed to the doctrine, he says, you'll save yourself. Now, how many believe once saved, always saved, eternal life? So we must, if you're comparing Scripture with Scripture, he must be talking uh, about something else other than eternal salvation. Okay, when you receive eternal life, how long does it last for? And so, you know, uh, here's what it's talking about. He says, if you give attendance to the Word of God, you give attendance to the doctrine of the Word of God, he says, you will save yourself and also them that hear thee, meaning that the people underneath of you are not going to fall prey to every seducing spirit that is out there that they're going to say faithful, stable, all the way in to the victorious Christian life that God has intended for them. Remember, this is a good minister. He preaches the Word of God. She preaches the Word of God. A good minister practices the Word of God. You're to be exercising yourself unto godliness. I mean, put every bit of effort into the Word of God. Practice the Word of God, learning it and doing it. And then also remember here that a minister also grows in the Word of God, practices the Word of God. By giving attendance to these things, you'll save yourself. And also, think of my children. I think of your children and them that hear thee. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your Word. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us. We have a sphere, we have a realm of influence. And Lord, I pray that you would help us. As we're a minister, as we're a servant, help us to be a good servant, a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for what we've heard tonight. Lord, I pray that we'd surrender our hearts to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching the video today. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more information about our ministry, you can visit us at lbbc.info. Also, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at mylbbc at gmail. We would love to send you a copy of this book right here. It's called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible. Also, I do a little bit of writing. You can visit my blog at pastorjack.org. God bless you, and if there's any way we can help you, we'd love to be a blessing to you. Have a good day.